It feels like for the majority of my life, comic book movies have become increasingly more prevalent in the movie industry. From the year 1998 when Wesley Snipes' Blade arrived into cinemas to pull Marvel's butts out of the fire and free them from the clutches of bankruptcy, to the explosion of mainstream superhero popularity with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, which was then followed by a series of hit-and-miss standalone flicks which led to the revitalization of Batman with Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, coupled with the spark that lit the powder keg of the MCU that was Jon Favreau's Iron Man movie which finally resulted in the revolution that was Joss Whedon's Avengers in 2012. A movie that was so beloved and most importantly profitable, it essentially skyrocketed the comic book movie boom that's all but completely saturated the film industry as of 2021. Now I love comic book movies, don't get me wrong. I talk about them all the time on this channel and I've grown up adoring many of these movies, but even I've come to the point where the next time a comic book movie is announced, my immediate reaction instead of being excited with anticipation is instead to groan with discontent and disappointment, especially if it's yet another remake or reboot of a superhero that I love. Prior to 2020, these mass-produced comic book films were infecting the cinemas like some sort of plague, and the only thing that managed to put a stop to it, although temporarily, was ironically another more aggressive pandemic. And so with the cinemas shut down, the big business titans of entertainment, the franchise blood-sucking, lawyer-touting, IP-monopolizing cunt waffles that are Disney and Marvel Studios, needed to adapt, and so they instead ran their IPs, both cinematic and episodic, into their streaming services instead. And rather than winding down in production, they decided to instead ramp it the fuck up and try to saturate the market even more. Granted, if you're competing with the likes of Amazon and Netflix, you're going to have to break out whatever you can to draw people to your streaming servers, and more importantly, keep them there. But what used to be an event to look forward to, another comic book IP being adapted to the big screen in a live action format, has now become commonplace to an almost sickening degree. I know for a lot of you, I'm just reciting what you already know and feel and have likely heard a thousand times before. But this really dawned on me when I realized just how disconnected I've become with the modern day MCU. I was very invested from Iron Man 2008 till Avengers Endgame in 2019, but since then I've become progressively more disinterested, despite the fact that there's more Marvel movies and series being made than ever before. As it stands right now, I still haven't seen the Loki series, I haven't seen Falcon and the Winter Soldier, or WandaVision for that matter. And before I get around to watching them, if I ever do, there's probably going to be at least three more series about characters I couldn't give less than a shit about, that I'll have to watch in order to keep up to date, and more to my point, I still haven't seen either of the Ant-Man films for that matter, for the very same reason, and that's despite the fact that those movies took place in an era of the MCU where I was heavily invested. The only halfway decent MCU product we've received post-Avengers Endgame was Spider-Man Far From Home, and that was a disappointment for me personally. Aside from that, we got Black Widow, and that movie was regrettably terrible, and clearly made out of obligation to give a character that they popularized in the past her own movie in order to try and milk money from pre-established fans who had waited over a decade for it, and this is really no different to how all these other MCU products are being made. Because now that the well is drying up, Disney and Marvel Studios are essentially throwing every character at the wall with a movie of their own in order to see what sticks but all likely end up being churned out as low effort, corporately produced garbage at the end of the day. I know a lot of you will likely make the point that this is what the MCU has always been, it's always been garbage, and that this trend started long before 2020. And I think that's a fair perspective to have, but what I think we can all agree on is that this trend is getting worse. And this made me wonder, are comic book movies the problem? Are they what's killing the film industry? Have we reached that point where we've, we're just gonna keep getting them and getting them and getting them until the end of time? And how many new awesome original films are being thrown to the wayside to make way for these corporate produced trash fires? And then I was reminded of a quote made by Martin Scorsese, one of the most renowned filmmakers of all time, and his stance on how Marvel films, quote, are not cinema. Now before I continue, I should probably let you guys know, and feel free to shoot me in the comments section, I'm not really a Martin Scorsese fan. Never have been, in fact. I think there are maybe three of his films that I actually like, those being Casino, Gangs of New York, and The Departed. I've just never been the biggest fan of his style, per se. His choice of projects. And I've always kind of despised 
how he portrays real life accounts of his criminal drama flicks. I've always felt he paints these real life characters, these criminals in a light that reflects too kindly on them. At least that's the vibe I've always gotten from his films. And that's one of the reasons why I like The Departed in fact, because yes it's a crime flick but it's entirely a work of fiction. And yeah while I do like Casino and Gangs of New York, they are the exception, though I do have one guilty pleasure when it comes to Scorsese and that is The Wolf of Wall Street because even though it has just about every Scorseseism I despise, it's also a very charming and fucking hilarious movie. <laughs> You guys can feel free to disagree with my take there on Scorsese and his movies, but let me make it clear once again, the problem I have with Scorsese comes down to personal taste. He is truthfully a fantastic filmmaker, and his stance on cinema as a whole carries so much weight for a very good reason. But what I'm trying to outline here is that when it comes to Scorsese's take on Marvel films, I'm not one of these people who hands the man blind praise for everything he makes and everything he says. But having said that, and having seen how much Marvel as an entity and comic book movies as a whole have degraded in recent years, I revisited his quote and came across this interview where he further clarifies his stance on the matter and I realized Mullen School says he actually had a great point to make. I just think he went about it in the wrong way and cast the blame in the wrong direction. Here is the interview with Martin Scorsese in Empire Magazine back in 2019. I was asked a question about Marvel movies. I answered it. I said that I've tried to watch a few of them and that they're not for me. That they seem to me to be closer to theme park rides than they are to movies, and that in the end, I don't think they're cinema. Some people seem to have seized on that last part of my answer as insulting, or as evidence of hatred for Marvel on my part. If anyone is intent on characterizing my words in that light, there's nothing I can do to stand in the way. Many franchise films are made by people of considerable talent and artistry. You can see it on the screen. The fact that the films themselves don't interest me is a matter of personal taste and temperament. I know that if I were younger, I'd come of age at a later time, I might have been excited for these pictures and maybe even wanted to make one myself, but I grew up when I did and developed a sense of movies of what they were and what they could be. That was as far from the Marvel Universe as we on Earth are from Alpha Centauri. For me, for the filmmakers I came to love and respect, for my friends who started making movies around the same time that I did, cinema was about revelation. Aesthetic, emotional, and spiritual revelation. It was about characters, the complexity of people and their contradictory and sometimes paradoxical natures, the way they can hurt one another and love one another and suddenly come face to face with themselves. It was about confronting the unexpected on the screen and in the life it dramatized and interpreted and enlarging the sense of what was possible in the art form. And that was the key for us. It was an art form. There was some debate about that at the time, so we stood up for cinema as an equal to literature or music or dance, and we came to understand that the art could be found in many different places, and in just as many forms, in The Steel Helmet by Sam Fuller, and Persona by Igmar Bergman, in It's Always Fairweather by Gene Kelly and Stan Donan, and Scorpio Rising by Kenneth Anger. Or in the films of Alfred Hitchcock, I suppose you could say that Hitchcock was his own franchise, or that he was our franchise. Every new Hitchcock picture was an event. To be in a packed house in one of those old theatres watching Rear Window was an extraordinary experience. It was an event created by the chemistry between the audience and the picture itself, and it was electrifying. And in a way, certain Hitchcock films were also like theme parks. I'm thinking of Strangers on a Train, in which the climax takes place on a merry-go-round at a real amusement park, and Psycho, which I saw at a midnight show on its opening day, an experience I will never forget. People went in to be surprised and thrilled, and they weren't disappointed. 60 or 70 years later, we're still watching those pictures and marveling at them, but is it the thrills and the shocks that we keep going back to? I don't think so. The set pieces in North by Northwest are stunning, but they would be nothing more than a succession of dynamic and elegant compositions and cuts without the painful emotions at the center of the story, or the absolute lostness of Cary Grant's character. The climax of Strangers on a Train is a feat, but it's the interplay between the two principal characters 
and Robert Walker's profoundly unsettling performance that resonate now. Some say that Hitchcock's pictures had a sameness to them, and perhaps that's true. Hitchcock himself wondered about it. But the sameness of today's franchise pictures is something else again. Many of the elements that define cinema as I know it are there in Marvel pictures. What's not there is revelation, mystery, or genuine emotional danger. Nothing is at risk. The pictures are made to satisfy a specific set of demands, and they are designed as variations on a finite number of themes. They are sequels in name, but they are remakes in spirit, and everything in them is officially sanctioned because it can't really be any other way. That's the nature of modern film franchises. Market researched, audience tested, vetted, modified, re-vetted, and remodeled until they're ready for consumption. Another way of putting it would be that they are everything that the films of Paul Thomas Anderson or Claire Dennis or Spike Lee or Ari Aster or Catherine Bigelow or Wes Anderson are not. When I watch a movie by any of those filmmakers, I know I'm going to see something absolutely new and to be taken to unexpected and maybe unnameable areas of experience. My sense of what is possible in telling stories with moving images and sounds is going to be expanded. So you might ask, what's my problem? Why not just let superhero films and other franchise films be? The reason is simple. In many places around this country and around the world, franchise films are now your primary choice if you want to see something on the big screen. It's a perilous time in film exhibition. There are fewer and fewer independent theatres than ever. The equation has flipped and streaming has become the primary delivery system. Still, I don't know a single filmmaker who doesn't want to design films for the big screen to be projected before an audience in theaters. That includes me, and I'm speaking as someone who just completed a picture for Netflix, and it alone allowed us to make The Irishman the way we needed to. And for that, I'll always be thankful. We have a theatrical window, which is great. Would I like the picture to play on more big screens for longer periods of time? Of course I would. But no matter whom you make your movie with, the fact is that the screens in most multiplexes are crowded with franchise pictures. And if you're going to tell me it's simply a matter of supply and demand and giving people what they want, I'm going to disagree. It's a chicken and the egg issue. If people are given only one kind of thing and endlessly sold on one kind of thing, of course they are going to want more of that kind of thing. But you might argue, can't they just go home and watch anything they want on Netflix or iTunes or Hulu? Sure, anywhere but on the big screen, where the filmmaker intended her or his picture to be seen. In the past 20 years, as we all know, the movie business has changed on all fronts. But the most ominous change has happened stealthily and under cover of night. The gradual but steady elimination of risk. Many films today are perfect products, manufactured for immediate consumption. Many of them are well made by teams of talented individuals. All the same, they lack something essential to cinema. The unifying vision of an individual artist because, of course, the individual artist is the riskiest factor of them all. I'm certainly not implying that movies should be a subsidized art form, or that they ever were. When the Hollywood studio system was still alive and well, the tension between the artists and the people who ran the business was constant and intense, but it was a productive tension that gave us some of the greatest films ever made. In the words of Bob Dylan, the best of them were heroic and visionary. Today that tension is gone, and there are some in the business with absolute indifference to the very question of art and an attitude towards the history of cinema that is both dismissive and proprietary. A lethal combination. The situation sadly is that we now have two separate fields. There's worldwide audiovisual entertainment and there's cinema. They still overlap from time to time but that's becoming increasingly rare and I fear that the financial dominance of one is being used to marginalize and even belittle the existence of the other. For anyone who dreams of making movies or who is just starting out, the situation at this moment is brutal and inhospitable to art and the act of simply writing those words fills me with terrible sadness. So what Martin Scorsese is essentially saying is that in his eyes, cinema is meant to be an art form where the artist is given the freedom to create and tell a story how they see fit, and that there was a mutual respect between the studio and creator that allowed for a degree of risk in the production. And this is why he cited so many well-known and respected filmmakers and their works because of what this mutual respect and freedom had achieved in the past. And you know what else? He is absolutely correct with his description of Marvel films, at least pertaining to the MCU. 
After all, you don't have to look very far to see just how suffocated by studio meddling and interference the MCU has become. What used to be a compromise has now turned into something of a dictatorship where the writers and directors in large part have to toe the line or risk losing their jobs. The best examples I can point to is Jon Favreau having production difficulties on Iron Man 2, Joss Whedon's nightmarish production on Age of Ultron, and even though I haven't seen the movie, probably most mortifying is Edgar Wright being kicked off the Ant-Man project he was developing for years. And with the studios pretty much restricting any and all true creative freedom, the personality, charm, and most importantly, the risk that Scorsese spoke of is being lost. And what is instead being manufactured is mass-produced, corporate-approved, hollow-shelled movies that are designed to simply tick boxes and nothing more, as well as being carefully constructed in a way that's designed to leave hanging threads in order to set up the next film, whilst leaving little of true substance or artistry in the actual movie itself. Although, to be fair, I'd say there are some very few exceptions in the MCU that does abide by Scorsese's criteria. Probably the most recent example, which is actually quite a shame in fact, since it was back in 2014, which isn't very recent at all, would be Guardians of the Galaxy. Since that film came seemingly out of nowhere and none of the casual Marvel fans knew about it, it was very clearly a James Gunn movie, more so than a by-the-numbers MCU project. And for Marvel to give him such creative control on an IP that almost nobody was familiar with as part of their cinematic universe, it's quite clear that there was a large amount of mutual respect going on between James Gunn and Marvel Studios, the kind of mutual respect that Scorsese himself spoke of, and Marvel themselves was certainly taking a very big risk. Guardians of the Galaxy, despite being a part of the cinematic universe, was connected to the MCU in pretty much name alone. The film itself actually stands on its own is pretty much entirely self-contained and has virtually nothing to do with the rest of the MCU until Avengers Infinity War. So even though Martin Scorsese is right about Marvel films in terms of how safely they're crafted, was he right to say that they are not cinema? No, I don't think so. Just because Marvel movies have become shells of their former selves, that doesn't mean that they aren't cinema, because the fact of the matter is that any film genre can saturate the market and be abused by corporate studios to be more marketable and safe as opposed to being risky and unique. Comic book movies, including Marvel movies, especially those pertaining to the MCU, are simply the most prominent in the current year. Every film genre has its time in the sun because their potential for profit rises, then peaks, and then fall. We had the 80s action boom with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. Those films were mass produced and certainly ticked a lot of boxes for what Scorsese classifies as quote, not cinema. Sure, they were fun to watch, but let's be honest, they weren't exactly the most risky or unique films in the world. And then we had the boom of natural disaster films in the 90s and early 2000s. You remember those films were being churned out constantly? Sure, we had a few gems, but they were like the majority of action films from the 80s and early 90s, formulaic, repetitive, and mass-produced. Despite in most cases lacking what Scorsese would classify as unique or risk in terms of their productions. Then of course we had the movie booms of westerns in the 60s, the low effort cheaply made boom of slasher films, and there was even a boom of vampire movies and television shows at one point. Hell I'm pretty sure that gangster movies, a genre that Scorsese himself is renowned for, had its own boom in the past as well, and I'm not saying Scorsese abused them, but all these genres once saturated the market, were abused in one form or another by Hollywood and its studios, and overshadowed upcoming works by independent filmmakers due to over-occupying movie theatres. True, the MCU is easily the worst defender of all those genres, under Scorsese's criteria for a film to be considered not cinema. But doesn't that mean that these movies could be loosely classified under Scorsese's criteria as, quote, not cinema as well? Yes. Yes, they would be. And that's exactly my point. So the fact of the matter is, regarding the MCU and all those other corporatized products and genres that were released throughout the decades under Scorsese's criteria, yes, those movies are still cinema. Certainly. But they were simply a niche of cinema that had been heavily corporatized and driven far more by marketing than storytelling. I think it would be far more accurate to say that the MCU as an entity is simply damaging cinema due to its overexposure and due to, in many instances, its lack of product substance and risk. And how it's all designed as a never-ending corporate marketing scheme to give you a movie that sets up another movie and then another one, etc, etc, etc. But it's important to remember that Scorsese knows that Marvel films aren't all bad and are not the problem in 
in their own right. And he's even gone ahead and clarified that by saying a large chunk of his dislike for them comes from personal taste in his interview with Empire Magazine. But in addition to that, he's also gone on record praising the likes of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man back in 2002. Hollywood films are, as you say, like Spider-Man, which uh, Sam Raimi's films I like, actually. And I'm very glad that it was a big success. And that's not surprising in the least. And certainly doesn't contradict any of Scorsese's issues with Marvel pertaining to the modern era. Since Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man movie wasn't made with the intent of creating a cinematic universe or feeding into an endless stream of sequels, and as is quite evidenced by the film itself, Sam Raimi managed to retain the majority of control during the film's production. The film had an artist who created something truly unique, there was a mutual respect between the studios and the author, and it was absolutely made with a level of risk attached to it. That said, I then do wonder what Scorsese would have thought of Spider-Man 3, for instance, since the difference is quite evident with how restrictive and meddlesome the studios were in that film's production, and it's no coincidence that the audiences reacted to that film the most poorly. However, if Martin Scorsese is worried about the sea of Marvel and mass-produced comic book movies oversaturating the market and drowning out new, upcoming, independent filmmakers with new, risky, and enthralling ideas. And if he would like to see those filmmakers and those movie ideas have more time in the sun and have more exposure in the cinemas, well, he might just get his wish. Since the global pandemic has all but completely caused the mainstream corporations like Disney and Warner Brothers to put their new releases straight onto their streaming services primarily and release them in theaters as a secondary means to distribute their product which may actually start to give independent movie makers more breathing room for their products to shine in the cinemas, but I suppose time will tell on that one. Anyway, let's sum all this up, shall we? So is Martin Scorsese right about MCU movies as far as their production, marketing, and intent is concerned? Yes, absolutely. Is it fair to say that they aren't cinema? No, because that would require hordes of other movies that pertain to different genres in the past that were abused in the same way to be labeled as not cinema as well. But given the prominence of the MCU and its saturation of the market, as well as comic book movies as a whole, are the repercussions for the rest of the film industry and the neglection of independent movies that are far more representative of, according to Scorsese, what movies are supposed to be, is this the fault of comic book movies? And are comic book movies therefore destroying cinema? While they are certainly damaging several aspects of the movie industry, once again it isn't fair to levy the blame onto an entire genre, because the fact of the matter is this has happened before to varying extents by other genres which have risen, peaked, and fallen during their most prominent time periods. Whether it's westerns, action flicks, disaster movies, slashes, or whatever, the genre isn't to blame. The MCU and comic book films as a whole are simply the latest instrument of what is actually killing the movie industry and the art of cinema and always has been. And that is the greed, manipulation, and slimy business practices of mainstream Hollywood studios, the killers of creativity and artistic vision. The corporations who constantly play it safe and engineer their products with such a reactive approach so as to carefully cater to as much people as possible in the most hollow and shallow way and with such tight restrictions on the maturity of their content as well as the substance of the story being told for fears of potentially driving any potentially profitable demographics away. Corporatization is what's killing movies and cinema, and corporatization is what's killing all media in fact. The closest example I'd say is the video game industry. Without going into too much detail, similarly corporations design shallow and uninspired video game products designed to simply suck up a gamer's time with a mediocre experience all the while encouraging the purchase of the next product and microtransaction accessories for the current product that the consumer has already paid for. But in regards to Martin Scorsese's comments, he certainly had a point to make. He articulated it very well in fact once he further clarified his original statement. But I think he cast the blame in the wrong direction. The man is a legend of the industry after all. He doesn't need to answer to anyone at this point. He's left a 40 year legacy behind. He should know better than anyone else the detriments that corporatization is having on the film industry and cinema as a whole. So I really wish he had outright called out the studios to blame for this rather than the genre that they're selling to the mainstream demographic. Scorsese's words carry so much weight and for good reason as I previously explained. So had he cast the blame at the right people for why the cinema he knows and loves is supposedly dying, I think everyone would have reacted much better and even cheered. 
Hell, I certainly would have. But yeah, this is my take on Martin Scorsese's infamous comments on the film industry concerning the MCU, as well as my perspective on whether or not comic book movies are destroying cinema. I appreciate you all taking the time to hear me out, and if you have any thoughts on the matter, please leave them in the comments, and give us your take on this contested subject as well. And you can do so while I give a very short outro. Firstly, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my Patreon members for their contributions to the channel. For those of you who don't know, Patreon is essentially a donation service for passionate viewers who would like to support the channel and its videos. I've left the link for it in the description for any who are interested. Secondly, I would like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my YouTube members for their contributions to the channel. YouTube memberships essentially serves the same function as Patreon, but it's far more practical for viewers who are interested in the channel's podcast. You can hit the join button if you're interested or just follow the link in the description. Thirdly, if you're interested in the channel, feel free to check out the channel's Discord server. What Discord basically is, is an online community where fans of this channel can go to congregate and talk about a range of different topics, ranging from Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, anime, video games, Marvel, and other pop culture stuff as well. Check it out at your leisure, and who knows, maybe you'll make some friends along the way. A quick special thank you to a British potato for helping me out with the audio for this video. Be sure to check his channel out, I've linked it below. And finally, here's one last thank you for staying till the end of the video. You are a legend, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.